um, as Andrew Dodson would say, um, don't all integrals vanish at boundary terms now? <laughs> they do not, my dear son. Okay, filthy physicist. A huge thanks to my Patreon supporters for making this episode possible. going to do a preparation video today and this is the preparation for some monster slaying here on this channel. I haven't done any monster slaying, monster taming on this channel for, for about a year or something. Last time we did so was with the Gauss multiplication formula, an absolute beast, absolute monster and before that with Coxetters and Amit's Integral. And yeah, this right here is the preparation for a very, very important formula, the analytic number theory that we are going to derive using Integrals instead of the usual element methods that would take about 17 pages to prove this thing. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy. So yeah, preparation video. It's actually a really interesting one. It's a generalized integral um, with respect to two parameterization today. And we're going to solve this today. And my method I used here when first solving it was the Leibniz rule for integration, meaning differentiation under the integral sign. And yeah, there are two ways you could do this. Either differentiate with respect to the first or the second parameterization, x or z. I for myself like to differentiate with respect to x because, um, yeah, I don't know. I just like to do so. And this is what we are going to do now. Meaning, what we are basically going to do is we are going to differentiate the left hand side first. We are going to take the partial differential in x of our r with respect to z and x, x and z, whatsoever. And we are going to do so on the other side too. Meaning this right here is equal to, well, the differential of this whole integral. Hmm. Generalized um, Leibniz rule would suggest that we are going to differentiate with, the, with respect to the up and lower bounds and then the integrand. But since up and lower bounds are independent with respect to our variable that we are differentiating by, namely x, um, we, we are going to make use of the, um, of the special case for the Leibniz rule. Meaning we are just going to interchange integral and the differential, bring it to the inside as a partial differential, leaving us with an integral from zero to infinity of the partial derivative with respect to x of sine xt e to the negative zt over t integrated with respect to t. And well, you might notice that e to the negative zt over t is independent with respect to x. Meaning we can bring it to the front and just differentiate the plane or sine xt with respect to x, leaving us with, well, chain rule, okay, t times the cosine of xt. t and 1 over t in the process are going to cancel out, leaving us overall with um, del x of i x comma z being thus equal to the integral, the integration from zero to infinity of the cosine xt e to the negative zt integrated with respect to t. And we already came pretty far actually. Now you could make use of plain all integration by parts for example two times, then you are going to do a phoenix integration technique to kind of um, bring this integral back from the ashes and, and get yourself a closed expression. But um, we are going to make use of a cooler thing you could do, namely the cosine of x t is nothing but the um, real part, okay, we are going to make use of the real operator, the real part right here, of um, the complex exponential function e to the um, i xt. Okay, this is what we are going to do. We are going to thus interchange the real part and our integral because in the real numbers it's a Banach lattice and the complex numbers and we can freely interchange those real operators, leaving us overall with the real part of the integral from zero to infinity of e to the i x t times e to the negative z t. Both are with respect to t up here, so we are going to bring it together into one exponential function. Also, uh, I would like to bring the negative to the outside, so negative t, factoring out negative t, leaving us with z, and then positive becomes negative because of the negative sign that we track to the outside. So negative i x integrate with respect to t. And this looks really tame, right? I mean, no need for integration by parts at this point. We can just integrate our exponential function that we are going to get here, leaving us overall with, okay, we're going to get negative sign in the process, negative, the real part, let's bring the negative to the front because it's just a scalar, we can drag it out of the real part basically. The real part of one over z minus i x and then e to the negative t um, z minus i x and all of this from zero to infinity. Okay, 
Now, what next? How we shall proceed? Well, at first we are having a really ugly complex number here because it's a reciprocal complex number, meaning we are going to basically rationalize the denominator, you could say. Um, at first, meaning we are going to expand this fraction by, ex by its complex conjugate, meaning we are going to multiply it with z plus ix over z plus ix, leaving us in the process at first with negative the real part. Off. Okay, z plus ix is what we have on top. I love being on top, to be honest. No, I love when my wife is on top. <laughs> and also down here, we are going to get just the difference of the squares. A meaning overall, this is going to be just the length of the complex vector squared, basically. Meaning, we are going to get sec, uh, sec star, sec star, <laughs> z squared plus x squared. This is just what's going to happen. Also, we are going to break up our exponential function as, as easy as it is. This is going to be e to the negative tz, okay? And also e to the i tx. And all of this from zero to infinity evaluated. Okay, now we have some stuff that we can bring to the outside. Just like our negative sign, which was a scalar, we have two other scalars here, namely e to the negative tz over z squared plus x squared, leaving us with negative e to the negative tz over x squared plus z squared times the real part of. Now, we are going to have z plus ix Times. Okay, e to the itx, this just screams for Euler's formula at this point, meaning this is going to be the cosine of tx plus i times the sine of tx. All of this evaluated from zero to infinity, obviously. And now, just one side note, we are just striving to get ourselves the real part out, meaning this real operator acting on this multiplication of complex functions is going to be indifferent when it comes to multiplying, for example, i times x and the cosine of tx. This is going to be part of the imaginary part, basically. It's going to vanish under this operator, meaning all we are interested in is z multiplied with the cosine of tx, as well as ix multiplied together with i times the sine of tx. i squared is going to give us negative 1, meaning overall multiplying those two together is going to give us negative x times the sine of tx. A meaning overall, hello kitty caddies, oh nice to have you here, I love those, those kitty caddies, I, I can't believe it, this is just a genius um, room concept I have going on here. Meaning overall, our del x of i with respect to x and z is hence nothing but negative e to the negative tz over x squared plus z squared. And then what is going to come out on the other side? Well, like I said before, z times the cosine of tx as well as negative x times the sine of tx. And all of this from zero to infinity. And here's where the fun begins. So at first, hear me out. Even though cosine and the sine are going to diverge as the limit approaches infinity on t, they are both still bounded between negative 1 and 1. So what we have in here is still finite when applying infinity. It doesn't matter. They, they just diverge to another number that we know about. It's not something that is really um, unknown, but it's bounded between negative 1 and 1. All that really matters is the limit as t approaches infinity on e to the negative tx. That's e to the negative infinity, that's 1 over infinity. It's going to vanish, it's going to go to 0 overall. Okay, that was a done deal. What happens if we plug 0 into here? Well, at first it's the second part of integration. Negative and negative is going to become positive. Our x, uh, 1 over x squared plus c squared is going to be indifferent of that. If we plug 0 into here, that's e to the negative 0, it's just 1, that's good. If we plug 0 into the sine, okay, it's just 0, it's going to vanish. And 0 into the cosine, cosine of 0 is nothing but 1, this is good, meaning this is just going to give us z. Okay, our differential of our i is going to be z over x squared plus c squared. Hmm. Now we have differentiated it, but we want to find out what our original i is actually equals to. Meaning, what we need to do is we um, need to integrate what we have here with respect to x yet again with good upper and lower bounds. What I mean by good is what I'm going to tell you in a second, all right? It's not too hard to understand, okay? Now, what we are going to do is to get back to our i with respect to x, z is we are going to integrate our differential of our i with respect to x. Now, we are going to plug up and lower bounds in such that we get out what we want and such that something is going to vanish. And it's really easy to see actually. So what will happen if we let um, 
x go to zero on the original equation. Let's let's take the limit as x go to zero. Let's let's assume that we can interchange integral and limit. Well, then we have sine of zero. Ah, whole thing is going to vanish. Integral over zero. Uh, definite integral is just going to be zero overall. Meaning, if we were to use a lower bound, for example, being zero, all of this is going to vanish. Meaning, I they a that x being equal to zero. Is going to vanish overall. This is good, okay? This is our boundary condition that we want to get rid of. Um, as Andrew Dodson would say, um, don't all integrals vanish at boundary terms? No, <laughs> they do not, my dear son. Okay, filthy physicist. Now, what is going to be our upper bound? This is what's really hard to see for most students and for most people watching here probably, but what is it that we are striving for? Well, what we want to get at is i with respect to x comma z overall. So our upper bound is just going to be x. It might seem confusing at first to use our variable of integration um, as the upper bound, but it's a common thing that you are going to find in, for example, differential equation theory um, or physics. <laughs> People are just going to use the variable for the integration yet again um, as the upper bound. If you don't like that, um, call it omega for example or sigma balls and then our i with respect to x comma z is going to turn into i with respect to sigma balls comma z for example. Really doesn't matter. Now that we got the upper and lower bounds out of the way, let us plug just definition in of the differential. So that's the integral from 0 to x of z over x squared plus z squared integrate with respect to x. Okay, um, z is independent of our variable x. Let's bring it to the outside. And now we got something that you should be familiar with um, if you watch this channel for a while. This is one of the identities that I have derived at the very beginning of the channel when I still made German videos on this channel. Yes, I did do German videos here. This thing is going to evaluate and you can find all the links under the description, Gauss multiplication formula, Cox setters integral and, and this identity is really important. So really remember this. This right here is going to evaluate to 1 over, okay, z. This right here is the thing we're not integrating over times the inverse tangent, arcus tangent of x over z. And all of that obviously evaluated from 0 to x. Okay, what's going to happen if we plug 0 into our inverse tangent? Then, well, our um, argument is going to vanish, it's going to be 0. So which value of tangent is going to give you 0 out on the other side? Well, if you plug in 0 into the tangent, so on 0 is going to vanish. This is good, right? And um, don't forget, we have a factor of z right here. z and 1 over z are going to cancel out in the process. And overall, we are just going to plug x into our x, leaving us overall with the solution to our problem that i of x comma z is hence nothing but the inverse tangent of x over z. And this is really important, that's a really important identity and a really cool um, integrator identity in itself if you ask me. Double parameterization turns out to yield such a nice answer. I thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and comment channel if you like. I broke my Hagoromo chuck in the process, this is not good, but never mind. Um, I can eat the rest if it's too small, okay? Um, other than that, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to check out Flammy 2 and until the next video, I wish you guys some um, I'm going to take a snacky day. Ciao. <laughs>